Hello students, in today's lecture I wish to discuss about Kyoto Protocol. Uh, however, I will also highlight the, the, you know, some of the features that I didn't discuss under the framework conventions lecture, which I have already posted previously. And thereafter, I'll move on to, move on to um, <laughs> the Kyoto Protocol. Now, if you remember in the last lecture, we did discuss about uh, the commitments that has been, the commitments that have been enshrined under the framework convention on climate change under Article 4. Um, if you follow that particular lecture, you will come across those discussions that I had with respect to the commitments under the framework convention. However, the framework convention, which is also known as the Mother Convention on Climate Change, uh, talks about uh, several other key elements, uh, you know, besides what we have discussed, be it with respect to mitigation measures, be it with respect to adaptation, technology transfer, then financial mechanism to be very specific, also known as climate finance. And uh, on the top of that, uh, it also talks about, uh, you know, reforestation, loss and damage. But the ambit of these elements that I'm referring here, uh, you know, initially it was mitigation, adaptation, were the, were the prime focus. But now things have evolved drastically over a period of 25 years. Uh, other elements have also received a due sign, you know, importance in several decisions and discussions and meetings in the entire forum of within the entire framework of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. That uh, is there under the framework convention. If you refer to the text of the said convention, you will come across this. Of course, these are, you know, uh, in a way they are important because it highlights what exactly the drafters intended to. Uh, if you remember, you know, when it comes to vulnerability, uh, you know, along with other so developing countries, several other countries and their uh, you know, responses also were taken into consideration when they adopted this framework convention, especially the small island countries, the countries with uh, low-lying coastal areas, then countries with arid and semi-arid areas, countries which are very much prone to natural disasters, countries which are in fact also vulnerable to droughts and desertification, uh, countries with high urban atmospheric pollution, and also the countries which are having very high uh, fragile ecosystems like mountainous ecosystems, for example, that like, for example, in India, we have Himalayan zones, right? And the countries whose economies are highly dependent on the income which usually are generated from production, processing, export or consumption of fossil fuels. Once again, India. India, in fact, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you know, even some of these states which we have in our country are landlocked. So we have more or less all the features. So uh, these are, you know, their inputs are very much necessary. So uh, when it comes to these countries, uh, which are very much vulnerable, uh, they're, uh, you know, they require, they seek certain assistance from time to time. Well, way back when they drafted this particular framework convention, things uh, were a bit different. And now things have also changed, like, for example, India and China equally, uh, you know, leading the entire, uh, when it comes to the Asian economy, these two countries have been leading and they have also contributed a lot uh, when it comes to the climate change. And if you remember when we screened that documentary, uh, the documentary by Al Gore, uh, there also India and China were pretty much your prime targets of the developed countries. But going back to the theoretical context of the Framework Convention, if you refer to Article 5 of the UNFCCC, you will come across something called research and systematic observation. Now, the thing is that when you deal with climate change, when you deal with problems relating to climate change, uh, well, your legal notions and everything is fine, well and good, but whatever decision you take, it should be based on some scientific findings. Even if it's uh, uncertain, even if it's certain, there should be some scientific understanding. And in order to do that, uh, the countries are required to carry out several, uh, you know, research activities uh, and, you know, and carrying out their commitments, which they have already been given under Article 4 of the same convention. Uh, the parties to this particular convention also shall also support and further, uh, you know, develop as appropriate internal, intergovernmental, plans, programs, networks, organizations with an objective to define, conduct, assess financial research, data collection, you know, um, systematic observation, 
uh, which of course uh, is very important because all these things, be it with respect to systematic observation or even developing national scientific and technical research capabilities or capacities, uh, especially in developing countries, because all these are relevant. The fact, uh, reason behind this is, until, unless you have clear understanding, scientific understanding, uh, your your targets that you're going to set with respect to your commitments. Uh, it w- it will be futile if you don't have an idea that uh, up to what limit you can emit or up to what limit you should not emit. The thing is that more or less the same thing. The fact is that all these decision making should be pretty much based on scientific understanding. It should be scientifically sound. So that's the reason because of which the research and systematic observation has been given very due importance under the framework convention, especially envisaged under Article 5. Uh, Now, of course, particular reference has been given to uh, the developing countries because when you talk about their access to information, uh, they are, in a way, they are struggling. They still are. uh, Some of them are pretty much leading also in several fronts. But the thing is that at the same point of time, their uh, scientific tech know-how might not be uh, updated. Right. So they joined the race the very later point of time. But now they are also, you know, in a way, uh, leading our, and then some of the countries have in fact uh, bypassed developed countries with respect to scientific innovation and technology but still when it comes to assessment when it comes to understanding access to these information exchange of this data because many a times the thing is that India being one side of the world and uh, your understanding about the climate of something uh, which is happening in the polar region uh, we need to understand the you know a cause and impact and the causal relationship can only be done, done you know, uh, realized if you have clear scientific data. Because when it comes to climate change, it is not confined to a particular territory. It crosses the borders. So it's very much transboundary in nature. So all the countries, they have their inputs. Because if something goes here, its impact, its effect might happen somewhere else. You have to connect the dots which will be based on scientific reasoning and understanding. So that is the reason because of which Article 5 clearly highlights uh, not only just enhancing the capabilities uh, of respective countries, but also to render support, share information uh, from uh, one country to another country. Education, training and public awareness is another thing. I don't know if you have heard about uh, there was this convention also known as Aarhus Convention, no, Aarhus Convention, sorry. Aarhus Convention uh, was adopted, it was adopted, of course, under European Union framework uh, with an objective to promote access to justice, uh, transparency, accountability, um, you know, and of course, public participation in environmental decision making. So, uh, you know, the idea was pretty much there to involve people at large, to make them aware about it, uh, to um, ensure that they have access to information on climate change. They have, you know, uh, a proper, uh, you know, public awareness programs on climate change and its effects. Their public participation has also been addressed uh, in a way, especially to address the climate change related effects and all. So developing countries are pretty much been once again in the focal point. And of course, training, capacity building, right? So training of scientific, technical and managerial personnel is something which also comes under the purview of uh, education, training and public awareness, which they have clearly highlighted under Article 6. And this particular article also uh, emphasizes on cooperation and promotion, not just in uh, local level, but or regional level, but also in an international level, wherever it's appropriate using existing bodies that they have. Now, in order to do that, what do you have to do? Do you have to develop and exchange the educational and public awareness material on climate change and its effects? You have to develop and implement the education and training programs, including like strengthening your national institutions, exchange your second segment of personnel to train experts in this field, particularly for the developing countries. So that is what uh, they have done while drafting this legislation. Sorry, uh, drafting this so-called enactment. Now, uh, the thing is that in addition to these uh, important two aspects uh, this is uh, something which you should I, I think I have already mentioned in our class uh, the chief decision making body so called the conference of parties it has been uh, of course if you refer to article 7 of the framework convention you will find 
about con- you, you will clearly find that the conference of parties have been established and it was established of course uh, as a supreme body of this convention it has been given the responsibility to keep up uh, you know all the regular review to, um, in, or with respect to implementation of the convention or any related legal instruments that the conference of parties may adopt um, it shall also make within its mandate of course the decision which are which very much necessary to promote the effective implementation of the convention and to the end it shall also periodically examine the obligation of the parties like their institutional arrangements under the convention with respect to attaining the objective of the convention in a way uh, it also uh, you know promotes and facilitates the exchange of information on measures which are adopted uh, by the parties to address climate change and its effects taking into account the differing circumstances and responsibilities or capabilities cbdr right uh, then it is also responsible to, for uh, facilitation at uh, request of two or more countries or state parties to this convention for coordination of measures adopted by them in addressing climate change and its effects uh, and and uh, let's not forget promotion and guidance uh, promotion and guidance as regards uh, the objective of this particular convention where uh, a bit with respect to development and periodical uh, you know periodic refinement of uh, several comparable methodologies to be agreed by the conference of parties uh like preparation of inventories for ghgs for example uh then evaluating the effectiveness of the measures to limit the emissions and enhance the removals of these gases uh and uh, in addition to that there are a few more uh, you know responsibilities like assessment on the basis of all the informations that's made available to it and uh, for making these informations available there are also certain subsidiary bodies which are which have been established like you have this subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice you have a subsidiary body for implementation and you also have intergovernmental panel on climate change which in fact conducts several research from time to time and share that information right because this is not just environmental in the sense like scientific but also to be very honest whatever decision making you are you know taking it sh- will have some sort of uh, socio economic effects also at the same point of time so uh, it will have a cumulative impact so this has to be taken into consideration so environmental economic social effects uh, as well as their cumulative impacts and extent to which the progress towards the objective of this convention is being achieved has to be uh, regarded by the conference of parties it will also consider and adopt several regular reports on implementation of this uh, you know particular uh, convention it will but the cop also makes recommendation on several matters which are necessary for implementation it in fact uh, you know mobilizes uh, financial resources and that should be in accordance with uh, the provisions of this convention and it also reviews the reports which are usually submitted by the subsidiary bodies i have mentioned here subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice and subsidiary body on implementation in fact if so required it can also seek and utilize wherever it's appropriate the services and cooperation or information which are usually provided by several other competent uh, international organizations or even intergovernmental and non-governmental or bodies so international ngos ipcc unep imo uh, then even the w I mean, they are all, you know, in a way, contribute. They can contribute to, uh, you know, this, uh, the, uh, to achieve the goal of climate change because more or less they are all related in a way, right? So this is with respect to the conference of parties, and um, every year they have their respective meetings and they adopt decisions and commonly known as the COPs in short, and somewhere or the other in very nice places they do organize. I think one COP was in Delhi, uh, but yeah, most of them or the other COPs were in European countries. So uh, this is with respect to uh, you know the. Uh, the framework convention and i insist you refer to this convention you also refer to the subsidiary bodies uh, another important key aspects which i believe is you know important here is the financial mechanism article 11 of the framework convention enshrines the financial mechanism under uh, this particular convention on climate change in fact this is a mechanism for uh, you know the provision of financial resources on a a grand or concessional basis which includes transfer of technology etc uh and this financial mechanism basically it shall function under the you know uh, basically under the parties under the guidance and uh, uh, and uh, of course there is also accountability adhered to this particular uh, you know conference of parties the financial mechanism at the same point of time 
shall have an uh, equitable and balanced representation of all the parties with a very transparent system of governance, uh, which has been clearly highlighted under Article 11, Clause 2. Uh, the COP um, and the entity or entities which have been entrusted with the responsibility for operationalization of financial mechanism. For example, initially it was GEF, Global Environmental Facility. It was the operational uh, agency for financial related climate finance. Later on, they created GCF, Green Climate Fund. It was shifted. So, uh, but whatever they decide, the COP decides, they can create any entity or entities uh, and they can entrust with the responsibilities for operation of these financial mechanisms, uh, which involve several you know, duties and responsibilities, like uh, they can adopt modalities to ensure that the funded projects to, the, to address the climate change are pretty much in conformity with the policies. Uh, they can also adopt the modal- modalities by which uh, particular funding decision may be rec- reconsidered in light of these policies. Uh, there are also with respect to the provisions by entity or entities of regular reports to the conference of parties on its funding operations, which is, of course, inconsistent with the requirement of the accountability. Uh, they can also determine a predictable and identifiable manner for the amount of funds which are very much necessary. Well, initially, they decided that they have to raise funds, and this will be from the public finance, so-called the developed countries chipping in and supporting. Uh, they set a target also thereafter. I remember it was $100 billion dollars us dollars uh, per year uh, but unfortunately they, they, they never attained that target because there were several such hiccups from the side of developed countries in fact who uh, didn't uh, support the in fact united states for example when trump came into power he in fact decided to uh, sign off uh, the paris agreement so this is these are few of those uh, you know hiccups or you know hassles or i would rather say hindrances which kind of uh, has affected uh, you know achieving the goal which they have set under the financial framework or financial mechanism of uh, the framework convention on climate change now coming to something which i believe uh, you know is um, very much significant from the context of uh, environmental uh, international environmental law and especially with respect to climate change and this is uh, Kyoto Protocol. Now, you must have heard about this particular protocol in several documents and several lectures, uh, seminars, maybe. Uh, now, the thing is that this Kyoto Protocol, it was adopted way back in, I mean, this is the protocol to the Framework Convention on Climate Change. It basically operationalizes the Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, by ensuring certain commitments for the industrialized countries to limit, to reduce their anthropogenic gases, their emissions of anthropogenic gases, uh, of course, in accordance with an agreed term, or so-called agreed individual targets. Now, this convention itself only asks those countries to adopt policies and measures on mitigation and to report periodically. And when it comes to Kyoto Protocol, it is based on the principles of uh, the convention itself, so-called CBDR, Common but Differentiated Responsibility, because it recognizes that they are largely, so-called the developed countries, are largely responsible for the current present high levels of anthropogenic gases emissions in the atmosphere. Now, uh, if you refer to this particular protocol, in fact, you will come across an annex chart, annex B of the Kyoto Protocol. In fact, it sets certain binding emissions reduction targets to around 36 industrialized countries. And along with that, there are several other European countries also, so-called parts of European Union. So overall, these targets add up to an average of uh, 5% emission reduction compared to 1990 levels over five years, uh, you know, commitment period. Now, what they have done is, you should be clear about this. What they have done is they have divided the entire scheme into two commitment periods. The first commitment period was uh, between 2008 to 2012. And the subsequent so-called the second commitment period was from 2013 to 2000 and uh, I mean 15 it got over because the Paris Agreement came and uh, this five year transition was also over where the countries were asked to uh, take necessary measures in their domestic regime so that from 2020 they can have uh, they can implement the Paris Agreement. So we are done with the first commitment period 
which got over in 2012 and then we are also done with the second commitment period which was done in 2015 so uh, so the first commitment period at that point of time uh, the target was that uh, you know add up to an average 5% emission reduction compared to its 1990s level that was the target that they will reduce an average 5% emission over a period of 5 years and uh, the second bullet point here is the uh, amendment the doha amendment that is the thing is uh, with respect to uh, you know uh, uh, the kyoto protocol there was also an amendment to this particular protocol which in fact uh, was adopted uh, on december 8 of 2012 uh for a second a second commitment period which was from 2013 which was lasting until 2020 so however this Do- doha amendment has not yet entered into force but a total of 144 instruments of acceptance are required for the entry of force of this amendment i would like to highlight over here that whatever you know the points that i am making over here or figures that i'm sh- saying or sharing with you all it's all based on the uh UNFCCC's original official website so these are primary sources in a way so it has been taken from their website the information and all the understanding is pretty much uh, you know clear in their respective websites and i believe i personally believe the framework convention's official website is the uh, database or the repository of all the informations relating to climate change and they are very much clear and very much updated so this is what it is so uh this is with respect to doha amendment now this amendment this amendment includes uh, basically three important aspects first and foremost is that there were new commitments for the annex one parties to the kyoto protocol who in fact agreed to take on commitments in the second commitment period which was from 1st of january 2013 to 31st of december 2020 secondly there was also a revised list of greenhouse gases Uh, to be reported on by parties in the second commitment period and finally the amendments to the several to several articles of the kyoto protocol which specifically which specifically referenced issues pertaining to the first commitment period and which needed to be updated for second commitment period now the thing is that uh, in the first commitment period around 37 industrialized countries including european community they committed to reduce greenhouse gases to 5% 1990 levels right and in the second commitment period the parties they committed to reduce their ghg emissions by 18% 18% 18% one 18% below 1990 levels so pretty much escalated so in the first commitment period the target was average 5% and the second was at least by at least 18% first one was an average 5% and second was by at least 18% below 1990 levels in this 8 year period from 2013, 2013 to 2020 Although in 2015 the Paris Agreement came into existence and this five years was in a way transition, so the still but the entire second commitment period continued till 2020 and the composition of parties in the second commitment period is very much different from the first. When it comes to uh, the Kyoto mechanisms or so-called market-based mechanisms, there are three. Keep this in mind. the one of the important elements uh, one important element of the kyoto protocol was the establishment of a very flexible market mechanisms which are based on the trade of emissions permits and under the protocol the countries must meet their targets primarily through uh, national measures so this protocol also offers them a market based mechanism there are three options that are there which were adopted in kyoto protocol you can say it was a brainchild of developed countries in order to incentivize Uh, you know uh, environmental or so called climate related measures uh, they adopted this otherwise it was pretty much a pattern that the developed countries were not that interested to invest until unless they have something in return some sort of incentives so you have this three market based mechanisms which were of course an outcome of kyoto protocol first and foremost is the international emission trading second is the clean development mechanism cdm and then comes the joint implementation now the kyoto protocol you know in addition to all these three market based mechanisms the kyoto protocol also established a very rigorous monitoring reviewing and verification system as well as a compliance system to ensure that the accountability the transparency uh, has been you know is intact and under the protocol the country's actual emissions have to be monitored and precise records have to be kept of the trades carried on 
Uh, just like you had this conference of parties under the framework convention of climate change, which I discussed in the initial part of this lecture, even under Kyoto Protocol, they created a decision making body and they named it as, of course, it's also a conference of parties to the protocol, but this is commonly known as conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol, in short, C. MP. Always keep this thing in mind that, uh, you know, when they had their first uh, CMP, uh, if I'm not wrong, when CMP1 was going on at that point of time, COP11 was going on. Then CMP2, COP12. CMP3, COP13. CMP4, COP14. Like that. So every year when you have COP, you also have CMP. It's a continuing thing. So usually this uh, conference of parties meeting, you know, conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the party studio career protocol or in short CMP, which usually meets or actually it meets uh, annually, sorry, annually it meets during the same period as the COP and the parties to this convention that are not parties to the protocol are also able to participate in the CMP as observers, but they don't have because they don't have the right to take decisions since they are just observers. And the functions of the CMP relating to the protocol are pretty much similar to that of what is carried out by the COP, Super Conference of Parties for the Convention. And as I've already mentioned, the first uh, CMP was held in Montreal, Canada in December 2005 in conjunction with the 11th session of COP. So remember, CMP 1, COP 11. So 111, Triple Nelson. This is how it started. CMP 1, COP 11. CMP2, COP12, CMP3, COP13, CMP4, COP14. So the last digit and their first digit are quite similar. Anyways, so the decisions which were adopted uh, in these so-called CMPs you know, outline a path to future international action on climate change, which we are watching, which we are witnessing. We have you know, a Paris Agreement now, which I'll also discuss in one of the subsequent online lectures. Uh, so the thing is that in between, there were several such uh, you know decisions which were adopted. If you refer to the website of the UNFCCC, the decisions that they have adopted right there from the inception of Framework Convention and Kyoto Protocol, in between you will come across several. Doha Amendment was just one. There is something called Cancun Agreement on, uh, you know, Cancun Adaptation Framework or con based on, on this Cancun Agreement. Then you have Bali Action Plan. Then you have Durban Outcome. Then you have Warsaw Outcome. Then you have uh, Copenhagen Accord. Then you have Marrakesh Accord. So on and so forth. So in fact, you know, with respect to Kyoto Protocol, which is also formally adopted the rule book, the parties to the Kyoto Protocol also formally adopted the rule book of the, uh, the same protocol, and they call it as Marrakesh Accord, which sets out the framework for the implementation of protocol. So there are several such major decisions, landmark decisions, which have over the period of 25 years in the entire uh, legislative history of Framework Convention on Climate Change. Or to be very specific, uh, of course, um, you know, international or global climate policy. So these three uh, market-based mechanisms that we have, the clean development mechanism and uh, joint implementation and international emission trading, they also have created certain you know, authorities under the Kyoto Protocol. These are the three basic authorities that you should keep in mind. Now, or uh, I would rather say these bodies are very much significant because uh, you know, they are the one who decides also how this particular Kyoto Protocol is implemented from time to time. So along with the CMP, uh, even SBI and SBST are also there for CMP, like the subsidiary body for technological and scientific advice. And then you have the subsidiary body for implementation. There is something, there is also a Bureau of the Conference of Parties, which also serves the uh, CMP. And along with that, you have these three, the Clean Development Mechanism Executive Board, which is exclusively for Kyoto Protocol. The CDM Executive Board, it basically supervises the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, which is their market-based mechanism under Kyoto Protocol. And it also prepares decisions for the CMP. It, underta it undertakes a variety of tasks relating to day-to-day -to -day operation of CDM, including the accreditation of operational entities. Along with that, you have a Joint Implementation Supervisory Committee, which in fact, under the authority and the guidance of the CMP itself, entirely uh, supervises the verification of emission reduction units. Uh, now, ERU, so-called emission reduction units, these are basically, these are units, quantified units, 
or I would rather say units to quantify emissions, uh, which they have adopted under a joint implementation scheme. So the joint implementation supervisory committee it basically supervises and verifies the GI market-based mechanism and CDM executive board, it looks into this CDM market-based mechanism. And along with that, there is a compliance committee. The compliance regime basically consists of this compliance committee, which is made up of two branches, a facilitative branch and an enforcement branch. When it comes to uh, clean development mechanism, it is quite significant because uh, you know, the clean development mechanism has been defined under Article 12 of the you know, uh, Framework Convention and uh, sorry, uh, of the Kyoto Protocol. And when you refer to this particular clean development mechanism, it basically talks about allowing a country uh, with an emission reduction or emission limitation commitment under the Kyoto Protocol. And for that, this particular so-called uh, countries that I'm referring here with an emission reduction or emission limitation commitment, these countries are also known as Annex B country parties. For that, you have to refer to Annex B. And they have this uh, commitment to implement an emission reduction project in developing countries. So they basically what these Annex B countries are supposed to do, they are supposed to implement in an ERP, so-called emission reduction project in a developing countries. And such projects will, of course, uh, lead them to earn a saleable, certified, and of course, quantified uh, emission reduction credits. So they will earn credits for investing in an emission reduction project in a developing country. And usually one ton of CO2, if they are reducing one ton of CO2, that will be equivalent to one credit point, so-called certified emission reduction credits. So this is how they are quantifying, uh, you know, the Kyoto targets under the CDM. This mechanism is also seen by many as a trailblazer because it is the first international or I would rather say global environmental investment and credit scheme of its kind because it provides a very standardized emission offset instruments this so-called certified emission reduction credit so you have a standardized emission offset instrument now and these cdm projects usually involve uh, like several activities or you know projects which are of course emission reduction projects beneficial uh, energy efficient also in developing countries like rural electrification project under solar panels or installations of more energy efficient boilers uh, and, and this mechanism which basically stipulates the sustainable development and emission reductions while giving the industrialized countries some flexibility uh, in how they meet their emissions and reductions or limitation targets right so this is with respect to the CDM and it is quite significant to note out here that the CDM also provide uh, emission reductions, um, you know, the project provides emission reductions and that are very much additional to what would otherwise have occurred. And this project must qualify through a rigorous and a public registration and issuance process. So based on that, an approval is given by so-called the designated national authority. So in each and every country, there are certain focal points also known as DNA, designated national authorities. And there are also public funding for CDM project activities, but it should not be, you know, lead to some diversion on any other official development uh, assistance. So this is what they have also to ensure. And the entire process is overseen by the CDM executive board because they are accountable to the countries that have ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, this particular mechanism is operational since 2006. And this mechanism has in fact already registered more than 1500 such CDM projects and it is anticipated to produce um, more than 2.9 billion tons of CO2 equivalent in the first commitment period. So yeah, the CDM, there's also an official website of CDM maintained by UNFCCC only. You can also check with that. You can also come across, you will definitely come across the CDM projects that we have in our country, India. Well, the next one that uh, is important is the joint implementation from the term it's pretty much clear when you talk about joint implementation uh, you have to refer to article 6 of the Kyoto protocol which basically allows a country with an emission reduction or limitation commitment under the Kyoto protocol once again the annex B parties are given and here once again they have a unit for the same also known as ERU emission reduction units and this emission reduction or emission removal project will be, of course, by the NXB countries. 
and it once again is equivalent to one ton of CO2. Now joint implementation, how far it's different from CDM? Basically, when it comes to joint implementation, two country parties are involved in here. And it offers a more flexible and cost efficient means also for fulfillment of uh, the Kyoto com commitments and the host there will be host party and there will be an investing party so the host party will benefit from the foreign investment and technology transfer will be also be a part of it so there is not just one but two there are two track procedures also under the same uh, usually the gi project uh, you know it must provide a reduction in emission by sources or an enhancement of removal by say these carbon sinks so this is something which is there now. Uh, basically, they have two track procedures, track one and track two. So if, a, for example, if a host party meets all the eligibility requirements to transfer or to acquire these emission reduction units, it may verify emission reduction or enhancement of removal of any carbon sinks from a GI project. And, it, and, and for that, they have to go ahead and there will be also a verification process. And upon such verification, the host party may also issue an appropriate quantity of ERU. This procedure is known as track one procedure. However, when it comes to track two procedure, if the host party does not meet all, but only a limited set of eligibility requirements or verification of emission reduction or enhancement of removals of you know as being additional has to be done through a verification procedure under the committee that i have mentioned a while back joint implementation supervisory committee jisc i believe i have mentioned it if i'm not if i haven't then uh, i'm mentioning it now the joint implementation supervisory committee is the one which will uh, go through this verification procedure which will uh, conduct this verification procedure on so called the track to procedure and this particular committee is an independent agency accredited by GISC only and they are responsible to determine whether the relevant requirements have been met before the host party before they issue uh, or even transfer those emission reduction units mm -hmm. so a host party which in fact meets all the eligibility uh, requirements may at any time choose to use the verification procedure under track 2 so this is what it is with respect to joint implementation okay the third one is uh, international emission trading or just emission trading also you can say that now with respect to emission trading you know uh, this is something which you should keep in mind that this greenhouse gas emissions or anthropogenic gas emissions GHG emissions they became a new commodity so you have commodified carbon because you have started quantifying it you have started assessing the carbon footprints and based on that you have also started incentivizing how far you are taking some measures to reduce that so this greenhouse gases became a new commodity a new because it has a market value and the parties with the commitments under the kyoto protocol so called the annex b country parties they have accepted the targets for limiting or reducing the emissions and these targets are expressed as uh, you know, levels of allowed emissions or assigned amounts at over around, uh, you know, so many reasons, but these are all done in the first commitment period. So they, they kind of allowed emissions, which are in fact also quantified in units, commonly known as assigned amount units, AAU. So basically what it is, uh, basically the thing is that the parties with the commitment so-called NXB country parties, they have accepted a target for limiting or reducing emissions, right? Now, these targets are expressed as a level of allowed emissions. So up to a certain thing or so-called assigned amounts. So during first commitment period, say from 20, 2008 to 2012, these countries, the NXB countries, they were allowed to emit up to a certain extent. So that's why they were assigned a particular unit, AAU, assigned amount units, and they can they have to like exhaust that and they have to do it within that particular limit only or so-called they have to utilize whatever they have in form of units. And the emission trading as set out in, if you refer to Article 17 of the Kyoto Protocol, you will find that it allows the countries that have emission units to spare emission that has permitted, you know, that emission permitted to them, but not used. They can sell that excess capacity to a country that are over their targets. So if country A, for example, got assigned amount units of say, uh, you know, releasing up to 13 units, say up to 10 units of uh, AUs, and it has only exhausted six, 
by adopting a resilient or uh, you know energy efficient technology then it has still four units with it that four units can be sold by that particular country in accordance with article 17 of the kyoto protocol to some other country which in fact ran out of the assigned amount units so this became a new commodity which was created in form of an emission reduction for emission reductions and um, you know all this principal uh, greenhouse gases especially carbon dioxide uh, you know they talk about people do talk about trading carbons and all so now uh, as per this emission trading uh, you know we can uh, track we can trade carbons like any other economic commodity and that is why it is known as carbon market there are several other trading units in the carbon market which you will also find you know like for example with respect to land use land use and forestry which is also one of the elements of climate change there they have adopted something called a removal unit then with respect to uh, cdm and uh, joint implementation as i have already mentioned they have uh, certified emission reduction unit and emission reduction unit cer and eru respectively even for uh, other you know transfer and acquisition of these units uh, you know there is a tracking period uh, sorry there is a tracking procedure so unfcc maintains a registry system and this also known as uh, international transaction log which in fact secures uh, you know ensures that there is a secure transfer of emission reduction units between the countries so uh, UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol, these two documents are very much important and the Paris Agreement, which is the latest document, that is the latest one on climate change, which we have been, like we have discussed, I mean, uh, over a period of time in our lectures, we have referenced to Paris Agreement uh, in the last couple of months, right? Uh, I'll also discuss about Paris Agreement in one of the lectures upcoming online lectures but there are several such major you know decisions adopted by say, conference of parties over a period of time and between unfcc and kyoto protocol itself there was this uh, you know climate change conference uh, it was in berlin 1995 then geneva 1996 then after kyoto buenos aires 1998 then bonn 1999 hague 2000 once again in bonn 2001 then marrakesh accord in 2001 new delhi climate change conference 2002 then they have a uh, climate change conference in Milan 2003, once again in Buenos Aires in 2004, Montreal also had this in 2005, in 2005, the Naira Work Program was adopted in 2006, Bali Action Plan was adopted in 2007, Poznan Strategic Program was adopted in 2008, Copenhagen Accord in 2009, Cancun Agreement, which in fact came up with this Cancun Adaptation Framework was in 2010, then Durban Outcome, which in fact set a roadmap for Paris Agreement because there it established this ad hoc working group which was assigned the response responsibility to adopt uh, you know uh, draft this paris agreement or any third outcome or any protocol right but finally we came up with an agreement then in, then you have doha outcome then wash outcome on loss and damage then lima then finally paris agreement and even after that in marrakesh katowice we had further changes with respect to the future of paris agreement so these are important uh, climate change conferences which were there within the framework of unfccc over the period of 25 years which is of very much you know um, uh, relevance with respect to global climate policy so this is what we have with respect to climate change and the Kyoto protocol and we'll know another one of the uh, you know future classes we'll discuss about paris agreement so until then just read Kyoto protocol once and discuss uh, with uh, your classmates if you can or you can refer some other articles which are pretty much available on google uh, so until next time uh, take care of yourself take care of your family stay safe stay home thank you very much